Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today is a very special episode. We have Jalak Putra on the line, who I'm proud to announce is an author in one of our upcoming books. And uh, Jalak is also a founder and managing partner over at Future Perfect Ventures. Um, first off, hey, Jalak, I just want to say welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to talk to you, Adam. All right. Yeah, I've been uh, for everybody watching this. You don't know. I've been trying to get on Angelic's schedule for a long time, hunting her down. I'm like, no, you're coming on the show. We're going to have some fun. So um, I'm, I'm excited to pick your brain today and really get into the overall topic, too. So how investment impacts technology and learn more about Future Perfect Ventures. We got to talk about the upcoming book. We got we got a lot to cover, but we'll uh, we'll start this episode the way that we start them all with what we like to call our Mission Matters Minute. So Jalak, we at Mission Matters, we amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. That's our mission. Jalak, what mission matters to you? Well, the mission that matters the most to me, and one of the reasons I started Future Perfect Ventures almost 10 years ago now, uh, is that I believe that uh, we can create a better world if we allow everyone in the world to participate with their unique talents. And um, and that's why we focus on investments, uh, in, in our case, uh, and technology that um, that allows everyone to participate in the global economy. Yeah. It's great and, and love bringing mission based uh, entrepreneurs and executives on the show to share, you know, why they do what they do, how they're doing it and really what we can all gain from and learn from, I should say, their journey and mission. So great having you on. And uh, I, as you said, uh, almost 10 years now, I know time flies when you're founding a business, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's never boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to I, I like to intentionally start a little bit further back because sometimes it's easy for um, for, you know, entrepreneurs or would be entrepreneurs are just getting started to look at somebody and see where they're at and just say, you know, well, they, they've always been there, all these other things. But we know we know the true story and all the battle worn entrepreneurs out there also know that there's ups and downs and everything in between. So maybe let's just start a little bit further back in, in your career. Like, like, how did you get started on this path? Well, if I go way back, um, when I grew up, I mm -hmm. thought I was going to be a writer. I applied to college as an English major. Um, I was very kind of creative uh, growing up, uh, never thought that I would end up in finance. Um, but in college, uh, I was kind of dared by, by one of my <laughs> freshman, uh, room, uh, not roommates, but uh, hallmates. Mm -hmm. uh, to to take an economics class, and and I, I was very green. I um, were immigrants. Uh, I went to public school in, in rural mm -hmm. New Jersey, um, so we had kind of very basic, you know, English, math. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have physics, but we had no economics classes. I hadn't been exposed to what economics was, um, and so he was. I, I was intrigued by it, and he he just thought it was kind of cute. And uh, so I signed up for the class and um, I discovered I kind of loved it. Uh, you know, it, it, these mm. supply and demand curves and we all know, and I know many years later that you can't rely on those, <laughs> uh, but it just seemed to make a lot of sense on, on how, you know, behavior uh, works around money. And, and so mm -hmm. um, I just became really interested in, in, in mm -hmm. doing um, something within finance and business, which mm -hmm. I never thought I would. Um, and, uh, but always had a goal. And one of the reasons I wanted to be a writer was exactly what you're doing is amplifying mm -hmm. stories. And mm -hmm. I thought that was a great way to make an impact. And this was all pre-internet. And um, this was 1990. I'm going to age myself. Um, and what I realized is that, you know, I found this tool, which is which is business and economics uh, that could be combined with my passion for impact. Um, and, and that's really what my career has been about. And so I went into investment banking um, in, in 1994. 
mm -hmm. uh, in New York and London um, and uh, was focused on technology and telecom and, and media uh, mergers and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. um, the Netscape IPO happened uh, in 1995, which was you know, one of those transformative moments where mm -hmm. you're just looking at the screen and saying, you know, <laughs> wow, the stock is just, you know, I mean, I, it, these bankers that I'd worked with for so yeah. many years had never seen anything like it. And, mm. and obviously it was really about the potential of this new medium. And, and while there was financial potential in it there, to me, um, you know, the, what could be created out of the internet was, was mind boggling, you know, better access to education, mm -hmm. you know, any information at anyone's fingertips. And we know that 1995 internet was um, clunky, you know, certainly yeah. most of the world did not have access uh, to it. Certainly people in, you know, Kenya and India and all mm -hmm. these regions I um, was from. Um, but my mind went automatically to what the future could hold. And that was really the beginning uh, of, of my career. And I'd say Future Perfect Ventures mm -hmm. uh, is the culmination of kind of all that passion, all these experiences, um, uh, and I created an entity uh, that takes all of that into account because I didn't see mm. one out there. Yeah, what what a great story! And I didn't. And so it's so funny. I, I hear these stories pretty often, where somebody started off in a, on a certain path, maybe on a more what they felt was a more creative venture, like yourself. You mentioned writing, and then you're like, "Well, wait a minute, business and wait economics," and you get drug in. Same thing with me. I was an artist, so I mean, that's how I spent all my hours growing up. And then I, you know, kind of discovered the finance side and. And I was in finance for almost 14 years after that. And now I've, I, so it's just, it's interesting how, you know, when we're, when we're getting started on something, like how all of these experiences kind of build on each other yeah. in order to take us in the direction that we feel we're supposed to be going on or that we want to go on. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like finding that mission and figuring things out, like it's a, it's a journey for sure. And it's an evolving process. Um, are there some things that you've kind of either leaned on or found helpful on the way as you kind of, I mean, nobody's a finished product. We're all, you know, growing and evolving still, but I just mean in general, are there, are there some things that you found that kind of have helped you along the way when it comes to kind of realizing your mission? Well, I've always been a little bit ahead of the curve, which uh, a lot of entrepreneurs are, right? uh, almost every entrepreneur is, who really makes an impact um, started off with most people thinking that they were a little crazy. Um, and, and that certainly, <laughs> you know, happened when I started my fund or when I was talking about impact investing, you yeah. know, when I was at Wharton in, in, in 1990 and, and yeah. talking about my passion around using investment. I mean, that certainly was not Something and especially that, just know, to highlight that for a moment, now now it's common and people yes. say it or ESG or all these other terms. But when you were doing, you're truly a pioneer in the firm. I had I had to bring that out just so people understand for context. You were truly a pioneer for saying that. Yeah, and and even ten years ago when I started the fund, it was um, I started it solo as as a woman. Very few, especially fan female founded uh, venture capital firms. Uh, very few solo, uh, you know, uh, single general partner funds. Uh, and then I decided, and we'll get to this, but uh, to invest in uh, blockchain, uh, crypto, artificial intelligence, IoT. So these areas that were still very nascent 10 years ago. And uh, so that added another layer of, you know, gosh, can I make this harder for myself? So I, I think, you know, getting back to your question. Your words, not mine, but I was thinking it. <laughs> I like challenges. What can I say? I take those dares and I run with them. Um, so what's really helped me is, is having that mission and that North Star and believing that uh, there can be a better world uh, and that, um, you know, there are tools that can be used to create a better world. And, and I have a vision for that and I have unique experiences. And I believe every single person out there has their yeah. own unique blend of experiences um, that they can apply uh, and, and, and whatever that North Star is, whatever that mission is, like, I, I think 
you know, when, when people are telling you it's impossible or that um, no one's done it before, and certainly no one uh, has done what I've done and, and built, um, and, and this is, you know, true worldwide, um, you just have to reach down to, you know, your beliefs and, and believe in yourself. And certainly I have friends and people around me who, you know, believe, believed in me. Um, but I, if I hadn't had that belief in myself, there's no way I could have gotten this far. Mm. So I, I would say, you know, being in touch with yourself, what drives you, what's important to you. Um, and, and, and if you have a vision, I mean, this doesn't mean that you don't take input and, you know, I've certainly um, had to, you know, scale back with the first fund, um, what I had raised because it was such a unique story that no one had heard before, but, mm. um, I didn't let that deter me and I kept going and I kept believing in this North star. <laughs> so I, I, I think that is key, um, and, and helping me get to where I am. Now, you mentioned uh, staying ahead of the curve and especially technology, as, as many entrepreneurs do. I, I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I'm like, I go out to be an entrepreneur and I'm like, oh, books, book publishing. That's very new, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit more on the, on the old school side for the products I've done. I don't, I'm not claiming that I understand all technology, but uh, I, I get it. But, um, but uh, and this is why I love bringing individuals like yourself on because it's like free consulting. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so I'm curious, especially, um, you know, let's say into the er in the early days and in in even now, um, blockchain, crypto, like a lot of different ways you could have stayed on the cutting edge in terms of technology, a lot of developments. Why did you choose some of these areas to focus on? Yeah, so around 2013, I had kind of taken a look around me and, and realized mm -hmm. There weren't any venture funds, um, you know, early stage when you're investing in, in three to five people um, that were investing globally um, with the global network that I had built over the years. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, you know, I, I feel like in a post COVID world, this is very obvious. And uh, but back then, venture capitalists um, were very focused on their own regions. And when I started my venture career in, in 99 out in Silicon Valley, um, you know, people would just uh, not even leave the valley to invest. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for, you know, New York, I, I moved to New York in, in 2004 uh, mm -hmm. because I, I thought there was opportunity in New York. Um, it's growing tech ecosystem. Uh, and, and the valley, you know, VCs I talked to, and when I told them I was doing that, a lot of them thought my career would be dead to move wow. to New York. And, and that sounds a little crazy when it, it, you know, thinking New York about is it a right now, like, technology ooh. ecosystem. <laughs> Um, but that wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Um, so uh, venture uh, is, is um, uh, you know, transforming very, and, and I'd say over the last 20 years has transformed uh, very much so, but, but still uh, there, was, there was room for evolution. Um, and, and so I'd already thought about a global thesis um, and, and I was thinking of all the internet connectivity that the world had you know, as opposed to 1995, as opposed to 2000, people have smartphones, you know, the cost mm -hmm. of smartphones, these semiconductor chips in these smartphones and being at Intel, I had invested mm -hmm. in, in the semiconductor industry uh, and, and Andy Grove is still very active at Intel, I was really lucky to be there um, at a mm -hmm. time when he was there. And, and so um, I knew how important all this processing power was to the applications and how people mm -hmm. could use it. And that's where artificial intelligence came in as part of my thesis that, you know, you have all this data being created. Well, mm -hmm. it has to be analyzed and, and computers and, and processing power can have, help analyze all this data mm -hmm. quicker. Um, to me, the missing piece was, okay, we, we have all this data, we have these analytics that are getting mm -hmm. better and better, but how can we transact with this data? How can this data be exchanged in a secure way? Mm -hmm. and, and we hear about all these data hacks happening. You know, I just 
you know, got another letter from no. a healthcare provider, you know, that our, our data is being sold on the dark web for yeah. um, especially our healthcare data or financial data. Um, mm. You know, there's just been so many hacks. And, and so when I was starting to explore cybersecurity encryption as part of the thesis, I went to a Bitcoin conference. I didn't know a lot about it um, other than, you know, it was this passionate community, mm -hmm. um, self-sovereign currency. Um, so I went in with a, very much an open mind. I met some of the most brilliant people I've ever met in my life, these developers, mm -hmm. and also these people who are passionate about the same thing I was passionate about and am passionate about, which is creating a more equitable world, more access um, for everyone. That's why I got into the internet, you know, where I mm. saw access to education and information. Well, when I started digging into Bitcoin and the un underlying blockchain technology, um, uh, it allows for, in Bitcoin's um, example, Bitcoin uh, currency to be transacted with without a bank. And the reason mm. they can do that is a network of computers. Uh, and this would not have been possible, you know, 20 years ago without the processing power we have now with computers. Mm -hmm. um, but computers verify transactions and, and they're held on a ledger uh, that is highly secure because it's distributed. It doesn't sit in one server or one place. Uh, mm -hmm. So I started thinking about, you know, why is so much of the world unbanked right now? Mm -hmm. um, or it's gotten better, uh, but it's because banks don't have the resources to, you know, open up um, uh, branches in rural parts of Africa and yeah. Asia. And it's just they they're, they know that there's some growth there because mm -hmm. the middle class is growing, um, you know, outside of the West and, and yeah. very youthful populations outside of the West. Um, and, and so the future is really in a lot of these emerging markets. And, mm -hmm. and um, what I thought is like, you know, the quicker we can bring um, these emerging markets into the global economy, the better it's going to be for all of us. And, hmm. and so this technology, you know, I started off thinking about the banking applications, but then it goes beyond that. It, you know, we, hmm. we've now heard of NFTs where, you know, creators can sell directly to, um, to their fans uh, without right. involving, you know, intermediaries. Like think about Uber drivers that, yep. you know, um, that, that they have to give Uber a 30% cut, you know, so we have all these intermediaries everywhere, uh, partly because that's what needed to happen to you know, sure. create marketplaces or these services. But, you know, just like technology has, has changed a lot of how we interact, um, uh, you know, the internet has changed a lot of the way we interact, mm -hmm. mobile phones have. So blockchain will do the same thing. Uh, along with, you know, other technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, continued, um, you know, uh, evolving mm -hmm. a, a processing power, better semiconductors, mm -hmm. and then this internet of things. So we have sensors, you know, in, in all our devices now. We have smart homes and all of that is creating data. Now you want that data to be secure and you want to be able to transact with that data mm -hmm. or, or uh, interact with that data. So, so that was really, you know, it was very much to me a continuation of, of, you know, technology evolution. And it just made sense that the next evolution wasn't going to be about centralized computing. And if you look at yeah. it from a really technical standpoint, centralized computing cannot handle all the data that's been created. Mm -hmm. So, but, but we can also create more efficiencies and allow more people to participate if we distribute that computing power. Um, and, you know, one, one more thing I've you know, been talking for a bit now, but um, uh, Bitcoin also introduced the concept of crypto incentives. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. each computer, which runs Bitcoin software, um, and it ha the software uh, will rush to verify a transaction that that's being broadcast mm -hmm. along the network. Whichever computer actually is able to solve that algorithm, mm -hmm. and this is all without human intervention, it's, it's software, it's computing power, mm -hmm. um, that computer 
the owner of that computer uh, as a reward gets some Bitcoin. So, so the incentive there is you want the system to work because it, they're rewarding you as it works, right? So imagine with data, you know, right now we've been giving up our data to Facebook and everyone, yeah, companies, right, and, and for free. Yeah. And what we get, I mean, look, we have gotten something in return. Of but course, a user experience, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Right. But increasingly, we're getting, you know, badly targeted ads. Our, our yes. data is being misused. It's being sold without us yeah. permissioning it to be sold or, you know, maybe permission, but deep in, you know, we all sign For off sure. on, on those user agreements. So now what if I could say, okay, well, sure, you can sell my data, but this is the price and this is my level of um, compensation that I would mm -hmm. want for that. And, 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 you know, we're still a little bit far away from that world, but, you mm -hmm. know, just like, you know, but 20 years ago, we, who would have imagined the world we live in now? Yeah. So, uh, so I believe that the, that crypto economic model, these incentives that we mm -hmm. can, you know, these micro payments we can make out, you know, to people um, will allow, you know, more people to truly participate. We'll have better data as mm -hmm. a result, um, and because people are incentivized to provide good data, and if it's mm -hmm. not verified as good data, they don't get that reward. So, mm -hmm. you know, that that's what we're investing in these days: is how do we create that world where we can create the right incentives, the right rewards, you know, everyone will figure out a way to game it, but those are not the entrepreneurs we back. We back sure. the entrepreneurs that share our vision that this technology can be used to create yeah. um, a more uh, equitable world mm -hmm. where more people can participate in the economy. And so you've talked a bit about, about, let's just say the technology side and your investment thesis and, you know, kind of what you're, how you're approaching solutions um, on the technology side. I'm curious to hear on the, let's just say on the founder side or on the company side, on the people component, if you will, what do you look for in either the founders or company or executive team? Like, how do you go about that part of your process in, in deciding yeah. whether or not you want to go, you know, to the next step with a company in terms of an investment? Yeah, uh, that that's such an important point here, because mm -hmm. as I mentioned, we're investing in teams that are you know, very yeah. small. Uh, the market may not be fully defined. We know, may not know, uh, especially in these really emerging new technologies, what the business models are going to be. You know, if I invest in an enterprise software company, say a Salesforce, you know, it's very obvious how they make money. With yep. a lot of these um, newer companies and newer technologies, we don't know yet, but, yep. but we're backing the founder um, that collectively we will figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really the founder that's driving the company. So the, that is, you know, I'd say the most important piece of, mm -hmm. of the investment. Now we, because we're an early stage fund, we look yeah. at every investment has to have the potential for a 10 X at least return. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, venture is very risky. Um, we go in early with investors capital. We want to make sure that we, see the upside of, of that risk that we're taking. Mm -hmm. So the last few years have been a little bit more challenging because the valuations were very high, right? We had high public market valuations and that trickled mm -hmm. down to, um, to the earlier stage. Uh, we weren't as active over the last couple of years because um, we didn't see a path for a lot of the companies to get to that 10x. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, you know, while the entrepreneur is the most important piece, there are mm -hmm. other factors, you know, that we look at in terms of, you know, the return profile. Um, and that goes with the market potential, mm -hmm. right? Do we think that there are gaps in the current market? Do we think, mm -hmm. you know, a Microsoft uh, would potentially acquire the company? Not every company is going to go public. Uh, mm -hmm. But when you invest early enough, you have more flexibility on how you're going to get that 10x return. It doesn't have to be a public exit. It can be, you know, them building something that mm -hmm. it's just not in the strategic 
a current focus of say in Microsoft, but, but they mm -hmm. know that they'll need to have that technology, you know, five years down the road. So they'll mm -hmm. acquire um, uh, that technology and that team. Uh, the other thing I would say going back to the founder is resilience. Mm -hmm. um, that, and, and I alluded to it before when, um, as an entrepreneur myself, Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do think that's been one of the keys to uh, our success. I mean, if you're not resilient, if you're not still around, you can't be successful. And <laughs> uh, as you mentioned, you know, there are lots of ups and downs, uh, often mm -hmm. within the same day, but certainly cycles. And, and most entrepreneurs I know have, um, you know, almost gone out of business or had to fund payroll, um, you know, personally. There have been so many times that you're on the edge as an entrepreneur and um, some are just more prepared than others uh, to, to be able to handle that. Um, and, and we help, right? We, I mean, I, you know, especially over the, the last year and then it, crypto has been through so many cycles over the last 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. We, you know, taking calls in the middle of the night. I, so we very much view ourselves as partners, but at the end of the day, the entrepreneur is building the business and they need to have that resilience, um, that, you know, belief in what they're building to, mm -hmm. to be able to stick with it through cycles. Yeah, I can see that, especially in the in the types of technologies that you're investing in and different things like it's definitely um, staying ahead. And and the entrepreneurs that have the personality type to go into those things. I mean, I'm always impressed because the amount of resiliency and the, as, as you mentioned, but also um, the ability to take that risk and to assemble those teams and to assemble your, mm -hmm. your you know, your leadership, because it's not just you. It's the individuals that have have signed on to go in that direction and believe in you like. I feel it takes a really special person to lead these types of companies, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes that gets lost. Um, you know, when you see movies like Social Network or yeah. it seems like everyone's doing it. I, you know, I always tell people. <laughs> one is not doing that. This not is not a franchise. <laughs> This is not a franchise. This is a, <laughs> this is creating something new in the marketplace, which is never easy. <laughs> um, so I'm curious. Uh, in today's market, you mentioned you know the last you know you know um, not seeing quite as much potential maybe in some of the in the previous years and just in general for your investment thesis. I'm just curious, any trends that are currently going on that are that are interesting to you, or you're like, oh, okay. Um, we're heading in the right direction. Just curious on what trends you see from your vantage point. Yeah, I, I have to say, you know, uh, regardless of what, you know, the broader mm -hmm. macroeconomic environment is, I, I've never been more excited about um, our thesis uh, and, and our portfolio. Um, now, within crypto and blockchain, there's been a big regulatory crackdown in the U.S., after yeah. FTX um, uh, and and the fraud associated with FTX, um, mm -hmm. and and so I'd say, you know, we're we're in a very uncertain situation in the U.S., mm -hmm. but we have a global thesis, and while we are you know based in the U.S., we mm -hmm. have investments around the world, and mm -hmm. and um, there are lots of jurisdictions around the world. I, and the, the UK just in the last mm -hmm. couple of days has, you know, talked about how important the sector is, is to uh, their future growth. Um, mm -hmm. I'm headed off to, to Paris in a few weeks. Um, mm -hmm. And, and there's a lot of developers building tech web free technology, India, we have mm -hmm. several investments, uh, Africa, you know, a, Going back to my origins and what I was passionate about, you know, at, as a child and mm. and just seeing all of these areas um, of, of growth. Uh, now, look, there have been lots of bad actors in the space. And, and frankly, that's why a lot of our investors invest with our fund, mm -hmm. um, uh, because we've always believed in, in, you know, that regulation, if the sector grows enough, you're going to have to be regulated. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, fraud, while it may be a, a good way to make a quick buck or, you know, yeah. if, if they're, you know, we're, we're in this um, to to create more equity. And mm -hmm. I actually believe that's the way we're, you know, going to ultimately and our investors are going to make money. Um, yeah. You know, this is not a charity. 
Um, but we also do believe um, that the return potential is, you know, even greater than mm -hmm. these people that are going in and out of the market and, and doing it uh, in an unsavory way. So, um, so I do. I think regulatory clarity mm -hmm. will be good for the sector. Um, uh, there, this conversation needed to happen, and it's going yeah. to happen over the next six months to a year. Um, and then, from a more technical standpoint. Um, this technology is, is primarily open source, which means the code is out there and entrepreneurs around the world can access that code and build on top of it. Mm. And, and that means that, you know, smart people on the ground everywhere are, are mm. uh, building new applications. And, and so this vision of, gosh, everyone has, you know, if someone is talented mm. um, software development and they can create something that is good for their local market, you know, uh, that, that takes off locally, I think that's a great thing. And we're seeing, we're seeing more and more of that. Um, and as a VC, obviously, like we believe that, you know, there are businesses um, that should take VC funding, but there are others that may not need it. And, and we still wanna see those entrepreneurs succeed and be able to build. And, and so the cost of building in this sector has gone down significantly. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the third thing is really the intersection of um, artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. blockchain technology, which goes back to our thesis 10 years ago. Frankly, nobody really understood how that would work, you know, with what I described with data and mm -hmm. the importance of analyzing the data and transacting with it, keeping data secure. Um, you know, we've seen through chat GBT over the last you know, few months uh, how fascinated pe people are with interacting with, with mm -hmm. technology. And, and so while that's great, there's also been a proliferation of deep fakes and videos mm -hmm. that are um, you know, created by AI that yeah. may not be true, but are you know, being misrepresented. And if you think about if we could track the provenance, where that video came from, how it was created, the data that went into the creation of that video, which blockchain technology could conceivably do, mm -hmm. um, you can have more information on yeah. whether, you know, it was just an AI experiment or, you know, whether, you know, you could almost score it as yeah. this this is valid. Now, again, we're not quite there yet, but there's technology that's been worked on over many years within blockchain sector, within mm -hmm. inscription, within AI that can all come together. So yeah. while you know, I think there's a lot of people concerned about AI and, and rightly so, and the data that's being used to create it, I also think there are these new technologies mm -hmm. that can help us understand it better. And, and I do believe AI ultimately can help us, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, do our jobs, can, can kind of help, um, uh, again, educate, you know, create access to information, kind of like the internet on steroids, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of is. Um, but it has to be, um, we have to build the right applications and, and back mm -hmm. beyond wars that are building those applications that can keep us all safe. Mm. Yeah. I, well, I, I always love bringing individuals like yourself on the show because you just solve problems for me. I wonder, I was wondering how that problem is going to be solved. So when, you know, when all these fake videos are out there, there's probably going to be some yes. type of score on the, you know, that, that rates how likely it is that that was a real video. Okay. I'll take mm -hmm. it. Thank you. <laughs> now, right. now the, whole, the me, amount of people in technology yeah. and what that yeah. does to, to make that yeah. happen, that's your end of the bargain. Me, I'm just going to look for the score when it comes out. And I'm be like, ah, Jalak told me about that five, 10 years ago. I knew that was going to happen. You Hopefully it won't be 10. Hopefully it'll be sooner than that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so good. So good. Um, well, I do want to spend a moment or so talking about the upcoming book. We're not going to go too far into it because it's not out yet. And when and when it's all out and everything else like that, we'll, uh, we're going to bring you back on the show to do what we call a book launch interview. And we're going to, you know, big old celebration there, but just keeping it super high level. Um, what are some of the things that you hope to present in the upcoming book? Well, I get asked all the time, you know, how were you, how did you see the internet? Oh. You know, and then you saw blockchain technology and, um, 
you know, it's, it's been a career of always kind of spotting what's next, looking at the emerging mm-hmm. markets, business models that we're going to transfer from emerging markets to the U.S. Mm-hmm. And, and often, you know, it was five, 10 years uh, before the rest of the world really started mm-hmm. writing about it or paying attention to it. And, and so in the book, I'm going to lay out, um, you know, a framework of, of uh, the way, you know, what's allowed me, what's enabled me to um, not only spot these um, kind of trends and investments, but but have the conviction and structure mm. investments in a way where it can be a profitable investment, right? And you're not just investing in a science experiment, um, but you're able to actually make money off of that uh, early conviction. Yeah. Great. Uh, I'm going to cut you off there because you already know I have questions on questions, but that's not today's interview. <laughs> we already, you already know. Um, well, this is first off, this has been great having you on the show. I'm glad I could finally get you on. Um, just have to ask, I mean, what's next? What's next for you? What's next for, for your firm? Yeah, we're, we are scaling. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I, I think, you know, the broader economic environments, very uncertain, but that's really when early stage venture uh, mm. thrives. Um, when, when, you know, every, it, I started the fund in, in what was a crypto winter, Mount Gox had just happened. People mm. said Bitcoin was dead. Um, and what I, I just believe that that was actually the best time to start the fund when, mm. when you know that people are creating great technology, but yep. the rest of the world has written it off. So, um, I view the next, you know, five years as probably like the golden age of, of um, you know, yeah. our evolution and, and really where the thesis of all these technologies uh, takes hold. Um, mm. and, and I think it's, you know, broader market adoption and awareness. I mean, a lot happened during COVID that uh, brought it along. I think even, um, you know, chat GPT coming out and people mm-hmm. interacting with AI, you know, helps um, in, in terms of a lot of the companies we've invested in. So, um, and, and, you know, globally, we're, we're certainly seeing shifts from a geopolitical standpoint and, and all of this uncertainty and shifting is actually, again, where the, when we have some of the best opportunities. And so mm-hmm. I'm really looking forward to, to what's in store for future market ventures. Fantastic. Jalak, if somebody's watching this or listening to this and they want to continue to follow your journey and future perfect ventures, um, what's the best way for them to do that? Sure. I'm, I'm quite easy to find. I, uh, in the first name club and Twitter. So at Jalak, J A L A K. I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, respond to messages there mm-hmm. and our website where you can see, uh, our portfolio and more background on these at, uh, mm-hmm. uh, futureperfectventures.com. Fantastic. And we'll put all that information in the show notes so that uh, our audience can just click on the links and head right on over. And uh, speaking of the audience, if this is your first time with Mission Matters or engaging in an episode um, or listening to one, we're all about bringing on business owners, entrepreneurs and executives and having them share their mission, the reason behind their mission, really like what are they doing out there in the marketplace that they feel is going to make a difference? Like that's the kind of stories we want to tell here. Um, If that's the type of content that sounds interesting or fun or exciting to you, we welcome you. Hit that subscribe button. We have many more mission-based individuals coming up on the line, and we don't want you to miss a thing. And uh, Jalak, really just want to say thank you for making some time for us. So good having you on the show. Can't wait till the next time we get to do this. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Adam. 